Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of College Hockey Talk. On today's podcast, I'm joined by a very special guest. I'm joined by Sammy Koldorat. Sammy is a former Vermont women's hockey player where she played in over 100 games with the Catamounts. Sammy recently played in the Olympics in Beijing, where she represented her home country, Czech Republic. Uh, Sammy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, and how's everything going? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And like I, I like to do research on all the players that I have on and just looking at some former inter- interviews with yourself, it seems like you haven't really talked about your college hockey experience. So my first question to you, I guess, is how often do you get to talk about your time with Vermont? Not a lot, honestly. Most people are, you know, most people want to hear about like my experience with the national team and world championships. So um, yeah, it's uh, always a nice opportunity to talk about my alma mater. So <laughs> nice. And obviously your alma mater did pretty well this year. I don't know if you had the chance to watch any of their games, but uh, was ranked for, I think, the first time in program history. I was just curious your thoughts on the team now and just how it's progressed since you uh, graduated. Yeah, I mean, it's really awesome to feel like, you know, I was part of like a building block to a program that's now, you know, showing some really, really big success. So um it's really cool to see girls that I played with like my their freshman year my junior senior year and they're just absolutely killing it so I'm so excited and happy for them um it's really really cool to see them succeed so I'm over the moon yeah and it's just going to get better from here on out you know last they barely made the tournament or barely missed the tournament so maybe next year they barely get in the tournament that's kind of their hope is just keep them yeah yeah exactly now, I start off every podcast just talking about the beginning of your hockey career. So we're going to talk about that and kind of work all the way up to where you are now today um, with the national team. So you're from Prague. Talk about growing up in the Czech Republic and how did you start playing hockey? Yeah, so it was kind of weird because um, my dad's only half Czech. And so I was born and raised there. But I was always kind of like stuck between being American and being Czech and hockey being a really Czech sport, I guess, uh, They wanted my brother to play. They wanted my brother to try it. I was stuck doing figure skating and I was just like over it after the first couple of lessons. And I look over the other side of the ice, my brother's having all this fun. I'm like, all right, mom, like I'm ready to, I think I want to try that instead. So she wasn't super happy about it, but she said, oh, if you play, you got to play for a year at least. And I was like, no problem. It's all right. And then I just never looked back. So it's not hard to get into hockey when you're from the Czech Republic, when it's like every single town you go to has a rink so worked out (laughs) yeah what's the hockey culture like there because I feel like here in the U.S. it's kind of a niche sport I think it's changing and I hope it does change to become more of kind of a mainstream sport but is it the complete opposite in the Czech Republic is it like everyone plays um, hockey at some point in their lives uh yeah I mean most of the time it's something that kids will do growing up like when the lakes freeze over people are always out skating um, as I said, there's literally a rink in every single little town. Like it will be, it could be like the smallest, most random town in the middle of nowhere and they will have a nice hockey rink. So, um, it's kind of like widespread in that sense. Um, and obviously having our own like Czech league and then having a lot of high profile Czech players in the, in the NHL. So, um, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of, I'd say one of like the biggest sports, um, back home. And growing up, like, who was your favorite player? Was it someone in the NHL, someone in the national team? Was it a women's hockey player in the national team? Like, who did you, like, like watch growing up? <laughs> My family was always a Philadelphia Flyers fan. And it sucks to say that because they're doing so poorly. <laughs> but um, I, was always, I was always a big fan of uh, the guys on Philly, defensemen. Like, Chris Pronger was always a guy I really liked watching when I was a teenager. I'd always be just, like, watching him and the way he moved. Um, especially as a defenseman like myself. So, um, yeah, any guy in the Phillies, I was uh, super excited when Yager was there for, for his little short period. So that was exciting. And we had Voracek and Gouda. So, um, you know, I can't help but root for the Czech guys too. Oh, yeah, no, Yager is awesome. It's crazy that he's still playing too. I don't know if you had the chance to ever see him play, but do you, like everyone has so many cool Yager stories. It's pretty crazy to hear. I know like he was kind of a wild guy back in the nineties from what I've been, what I've been, I guess, heard in the past. Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I haven't run into him, but my brother has, cause my brother played, grew up playing at the rink, um, like the club team that he owns and plays for now, Kladno. So um, my brother's run into him and Tomas Hurtel a couple times. Um, but I have not had a run in, although I would have like very hard time 
containing myself because I met David Krejci at the Olympics and I almost like lost my cool. So Ren and Diogo would probably be like game over. <laughs> yeah. Did you get to take a picture with Krejci? Because that was my favorite player growing up. I wore 46 yeah. because of him. Yep, yep, yep. I took a picture. Well, I, he actually snuck up on me uh, during an interview. Um, so that was caught on camera. That was <laughs> forever memorialized. But I do, have, I do have a picture with him. I was trying to play it really cool, and it just didn't, didn't come off that way. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel the same way. If I ever met Krejci, I would, I would be a little fanboying out. So there's no shame in doing that. But kind of getting back to the Flyers, like there were some cool players that you probably got the chance to watch. For Pronger, though, it must have been disappointing because after he got that eye injury, he really never came back from the NHL. He's from yeah. yeah, I mean, not 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 really. And uh, it was kind of a bummer. I had this big, uh, big like signed picture of him in my room that my dad got me for Christmas. And after that, I was like, oh, my God, who am I going to watch now? Like, he was like, he was like my guy. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of other Flyers players that I liked. One of my favorite players, and I was a big Bruins fan growing up, so I was not a Flyers fan because when the Flyers beat the Bruins in 2010, really broke my heart. So, but one yeah. player I always loved was Mike Richards. I don't know what he's up to now. Oh I yeah, talks about him, but he was an absolute animal out there. He played some pretty yeah, good he, accent. He was, he was a good player uh, for his time. Yeah, for sure, he was super fun to watch. I don't know where he he must have dropped off the earth. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't keep very good tabs on players if I'm being honest. But yeah. once I have a player that I'm like, I I really like the way they play, I just like zone in on them and I kind of forget about what anyone else is doing. Well, Mike Richards, he got traded to the Kings, won a couple Stanley yeah. Cup them, and then after that, I have no clue what happened. So mm-hmm. I know he got traded for, like, Sean Couturier, which he's still on the mm-hmm. team now. So I guess the trade worked out for both teams. But that's the only thing that yeah. – that's the last time I heard of him. But he was a great player to watch. And then I love Ilya Brzezgalov. I don't know how oh good he was Flyers, but, like, he has this one quote from the 27, 24-7 thing that they did with the Flyers for the Winter Class of, and it's just one of the funniest moments ever. He seems like such a great guy. Yeah, I like there's a there's like a compilation clip on YouTube of like best Briz golf moments and that <laughs> I watch that when I'm sad and I immediately feel better. It's just like it's so funny. You'd be like, Oh, good news guys tonight. I'm not in net, so the team has the chance to win. And I'm just like, What yeah. goal? He says that. It's so funny, but he just seems like such a cool guy. Him and uh Sergey Bobrovsky, he was he was my guy too, and he was on the Flyers for a short stint too, but yeah, great guys. Yeah, no, that those they need to bring those twenty four sevens back just for the moments like that because we was talking about like the solar system, like Peter Lavitz, like Briz came oh. in my office he just talked about the solar system, and you can look it up on YouTube. I know it's still there, but it's like yep. the solar system so humongous, big, right? And we're just we're just little tiny so things, <laughs> and it was so the funniest funny. thing ever. So, and then when the episode got released, like all his teammates were absolutely ragging on him, at, like when it came out, they're like. So solar system, it was just very funny. So, yeah, no, the, I'm definitely not the I, – I definitely – the Flyers have broke my heart a few times, but I definitely respect some of the players like Drew and all those guys. Oh, yeah. Drew's probably going to – if he doesn't win a cup, he's going to go down as the one of the best players to never win a Stanley Cup. Literally, but, I feel I feel for the guy. Just give it to him. Somebody, please. Like, yeah. poor guy. He might get traded, though, in this um, trade deadline if he wants to. So we'll see what happens with that. Yeah. But kind of getting back to your yeah. career for a little bit. So you talk, you played with a bunch of different teams in the Czech Republic before heading off to Show 8. So I guess what did you take away from those experience from the teams you had played for before Show 8 and just talk about youth hockey in the Czech Republic and just those teams that you played for and how it helped your development before you headed off to the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I like being a girl, I grew up playing boys hockey, so I only know, I mean, there isn't really any girls hockey in the Czech Republic, so playing with a bunch of boys definitely, you know, you are either competitive enough, you keep up with them, or you quit because you're not competitive enough, and you, like, you just can't deal with it, so it's kind of one of those things where it kind of forces you to kind of light a fire under your butt to keep up with them, and and to kind of have that, like, aggression and drive, because you know, at a certain age when I was like 16 or 17 and I was playing with other 16 year old boys, like they were going to be like physically much larger and faster than me. So I was like, I got to weasel my way through them somehow and like finesse this. Um, So it definitely, definitely forced you to, you know, be strong and fast. Um, I mean, it was, they have a pretty good setup um, at at all levels for boys hockey. So um, it was pretty it was pretty easy to at least develop with practices every day after school and then games on the weekend so it was 
it was nicely organized plus like extra tournaments so I mean the more hockey the better when you're growing up and I was able to get that which was nice yeah, you probably also learned how to take a couple hits too, which is also important, especially in college. Oh. It's very physical. Yeah, that was you either you either learn how to take a hit or you learn how to dodge if you're a girl. <laughs> or you mean occasionally you I can get like the little guy on the team maybe, but most of the time I was like just trying to like swerve my way out of that. So were you a good dodger or did you just took it? Uh, most of the time I was like, no, he's going to hit me. I'm just going to have to, just going <laughs> to take this one and just call it, take the L, move along. Maybe I'll get him back later when he's not expecting it, but it wasn't too bad. I didn't really get any big concussions until I went to college, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Well then talk about kind of what, what led to the transition to, from the Czech Republic to the U S playing for Chile. Like how'd you get the opportunity to go to Chile and what made you kind of want to leave the Czech Republic and go to the U S and kind of take that college route? Um, to professional ranks? Yeah, I mean, I always knew I was going to go to uh, college in the States just because my parents went to the school in the States. Like, they figured that's where I'd probably end up. So I just didn't know I was going to play college hockey. Um, My senior year, when I was trying to get recruited, it was really hard just coming from overseas. It wasn't really a big thing to recruit overseas yet, as much as it is is now. Um, And so, like, I had gotten a couple commitments and then been dropped. And... I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I decided, okay, I can go to this prep school, like kill a year, have them see me play in prep school. Cause obviously a lot of schools recruit from prep schools. And then it worked out nicely that my coach from UVM saw me play at the U18 world championships, my senior year spring, and then offered me a commitment for not the, that fall, but the following fall. So I was like, sweet, I'll just play at prep school hockey for a year at Choate and, uh, well then I'll just be ready for college so it worked out fantastic and I played like as a forward for half that season at prep school anyway so Mm. it was just like you know it literally couldn't have worked out better basically it was just like an easy transition was the language barrier tough at all I'm assuming not because you had parents from the U.S. so you knew how to speak English assuming in Europe like you can speak multiple languages in different countries it's not like here where most people just only know one language yeah I mean I have the advantage in like my teammates from prep school and from college they all thought I would come in and not be able to speak English but I'm like no English is my first language don't worry about it like no stress my check is actually kind of crappy sometimes uh, like 90% of the time it's just grammatically incorrect but people get the message so it was an easy transition it was if anything it was like culturally different like I didn't know any hockey slang in English yeah. I had no idea what they were yelling at me I was like oh my god like is this English so that was like the only change transition but other than that it was fine are you good with the hockey slang now or are you still kind of working on it oh no it's all four years of college and I figured it out yeah easy peasy yeah I'm still figuring it out myself and I've I've it's been like a year since I've played so um it's been it's I it's some for some people that you just don't get used to it no matter how long you play at least for me that's the case yeah no I totally understand it sometimes you're just like where does that even come from and no one knows it just is the way it is well, is it is girls hockey slang different from boys hockey slang? Because like the only ones that I remember were like Bender. That was one that was used. Like um, I don't know. That was the only one I remember to be honest. But I don't know if there's any different ones for girls hockey. Um, not necessarily like different words. I say just the way girls like chirp each other is definitely different. Like a guy will tell you like I don't know, some like he'll call you a Bender or whatever. Girls will tell you like. <laughs> go eat a salad you're fat like that is the difference yeah Yeah. oh yeah like like people think that we're just you know we're just all like nice to each other pretty on the eyes no 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 we will mm, it's scary like I would much rather play with boys at that point than some of the things people say I'm like oh god my feelings are hurt like sheesh yeah well at least with like chirping at least in guys hockey like you don't mean it like you you can just hang out with the boys on the other team after the game's over but once you're on the ice your enemies uh, it's probably different for you what's the like best trip you've ever given to someone or if, if you can repeat it on the podcast I mean oh gosh I don't I don't really I don't really chirp if I'm being honest like I really don't That's most of the time man. if someone says something <laughs> to me I just kind of laugh at them um I mean I don't and when I was playing boys hockey I definitely didn't have to a guy was like I remember this one time there was like a scrum in front of the net and this guy was like, oh, you want to go? And I, he, I look at him and he's like, oh, you're a girl. And he like skates away. <laughs> and I'm like, 
okay, cool. Like I was all ready to go, but like, all right. So yeah. most of the time, like I don't have to, I just kind of like stand there and like, all right, cool, cool, cool. So yeah, that's just my style though. <laughs> I'm curious about the recruiting process. Is it like different for you because uh, from, is it different recruiting European players versus like American players? Cause usually the recruiting stories I hear is you play juniors, you play prep school and like coaches kind of find you that way. How do they define like European players like that want to go to college? Like what's that process like? Cause I'm curious, especially for UVM because I feel like UVM might have the most European players on women's college hockey roster, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. My coach, um, my coach liked to recruit a lot overseas and um I mean, it's one of those things where I think it's it's hard if you're not playing on like a national team. It's easy for for coaches to go to like the world championships where my coach recruited me, where he can see like the best girls from each country playing um, with their teams. And that is like a great opportunity to showcase skill and just just in general, just as a showcase for coaches to go to. Outside of that, it's really hard unless you're sending video because, you know, why would a coach want to travel all the way across the country over the ocean to, to see one player in some random league in a random game? At, the, at least at, you know, world championships, you know what kind of level you're, they're playing at. So I know most girls have the most girls. I think all the girls that were recruited, um, the international players on my team at UVM were all from like world championships. So they all represented their country at some point or another. So. I think that's how it usually goes yeah and especially for like certain countries i feel like certain countries most of the at least for us and canada basically all the players have played or are in college hockey it seems like in europe it's kind of like you either stay in europe or you go to college like does is yeah. that like a player's decision or is it more like if like does the coach try to convince them to do that it really depends on the player and where they're from like i know um, it's hard, for example, like a lot of girls here don't necessarily want to go when I say here, I mean, Sweden, um, they don't want to go because if they get a, deg a degree in the United States, it means nothing when they come back here. So it'd be like four years to get a degree that isn't going to help them. Um, because obviously as women, we don't necessarily have as many opportunities to kind of have like a nice cushy life with like a nice salary playing ice hockey. So, um, we you know that's one big thing or some girls feel that they would further develop by playing in a professional league here they would have a better salary by living here versus getting a scholarship so it really depends on like what their career goals are as well um that's kind of typically the reasons i hear um mm -hmm. but of course a lot of people do want like the college hockey experience and and uh you know the the sort of skill and talent that that league brings so yeah really depends. It seems like more European players are going to college now. I don't know if you've realized that as well. It seems like to me, like every year there's like more and more foreign players coming to college, which I like personally. I think it makes it better. Like I heard one coach said, you want to get players from different cultures because it helps you grow as a person if you're not from yeah. those cultures. So it seems like it's, it seems like it's growing. I don't know from your perspective, does it seem like it's growing or do you think there's some, I guess, I guess there, do you think there needs to be like, do you think there's going to be more players in the future to grow? Like it's not just going to stop here. Yeah, I hope so. I think that, you know, I think a lot of girls want the experience to speak English and grow up and live in the States and um, kind of have like, again, like the American college experience that you can't necessarily get here where school and hockey are integrated really well into each other. Um, I personally think it's awesome, you know, just again, like you said, the kind of the cultural thing. Um, I think it just helps you grow as a person and it's fun to have a lot of different like characters and cultures on a team i know i certainly had a really great time with like my best friends from the team that are from you know all over the place so that's that's always really cool I, and i hope that like the trend continues because that would be it'd be awesome for for the league for sure yeah i know it seems like it's trending in women's hockey but also in men's hockey as well i know there's a guy from uconn from the czech republic so it's pretty cool like mm -hmm. how it's growing in both men's and women's hockey as well Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now, talk about your time with Choi. I'm curious about that. Obviously, it was a prep, a kind of a prep school year for you heading into college, but um, how did it help prepare you for college hockey? And what did you take away from that experience before heading off to Vermont? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of weird for me because it was like the first time I ever lived in the United States. And obviously, you're living away from home, you're in dorms, you're kind of just, a, you know, you're a little adult who has to combined school and hockey so if anything it was kind of a great great little stepping stone to college because when I got to college I was like all right like I've done this before 
I can do my laundry, eat and go to practice. Like it's all under control. Cause I know it can be a lot, of, you know, it's pretty scary for some kids to leave home for the first time and get thrown into college and having to be super organized and do your work and go to practice and perform. So, um, if anything, it just kind of prepared me for that experience. So it was an easy transition to college after that. It was just like a mini college before the real thing. Yeah. And how was the hockey there? Was it fun? Yeah, it was super fun. I mean, it was all, all girls that are aspiring D3, D1 players. So there was a great talent level. Um, it was an immediate way to make friends. So it wasn't as daunting for me to kind of go into a new environment with like not knowing anyone. I immediately had like 20 people where I was like, oh, sweet, like new friends um so I mean yeah it was it was it was a great experience now you were telling me how you got noticed by Vermont playing in the U18 world championships I'm curious how what made you kind of want to go to Vermont versus some of the other schools that you might have looked at um because obviously Burlington's a nice town but compared to the the teams in hockey East, the bus rides seem like it might kind of persuade people to go somewhere else yeah, I mean, um, honestly, Vermont wasn't even on my radar. I didn't even know about it as a school or anything. Um, like when I toured the campus, it very much kind of fit what I was looking for. There's like a downtown area. The campus was really kind of like mid medium size, which is what I wanted. I loved the rink. I liked the facilities. Um, and especially like from an education standpoint, it fit my career goals with a training hospital, like a teaching hospital on campus and like a great sciences program. Um, so, I mean, I loved the way that our practices were structured. We played music at practice. We played small games at practice. Like I was all about that. Like if I want to go to practice and play games and that's what they're giving me, I'm, I'm there for it. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the bus rides weren't great, but again, it wasn't terrible. I mean, the Boston schools were about three hours away. I think <laughs> Maine takes the award for the worst bus rides for sure because they're even farther out in the boonies than we are yeah well at least like I don't know what's there to do in Maine to be honest with you at least Vermont like Burlington's such a nice city I guess there's yeah. stuff like near like the campus in Maine that you can go to because some of my buddies went to a game there and they said like Alphonse an awesome rank and the, there's like stuff to do like near that campus but it's kind of like a hike just to get up there at least with Burlington yeah. like it's like everything's like in one area yeah, Burlington's great in that you can, there's so much to do in the winter and in the summer, like there's always outdoors activities, there's always different events going, and it's a really cool community, um, and even outside of Burlington, like there's always a mountain to hike, a mountain to ski, you know, all sorts of different things that you can kind of do, so four years gave me a lot of time and a lot of things to do there, which was, actually I was there for five, but that doesn't count. <laughs> four years of college hockey, that's, that's what it gave me, so I was really happy. Did you get to ski at all when you were down there? Were you much of a skier before or are now you an expert because you had the experience? Well, ironically, we weren't really allowed to, we weren't allowed to like go and ski and snowboard because if we got hurt, then we would look really stupid coming back from the mountain. <laughs> and like, oh, sorry, coach, I can't play this weekend. Just my ankle skiing. Like, like yeah. we, would have just, like, we would have gotten in such deep trouble for that. So I didn't do it. Ironically, I didn't do any skiing. I haven't, I honestly haven't gone in like eight years or something ridiculous after I like sold my soul to ice hockey. It kind of, kind of never, never got back on. <laughs> Now, what was the biggest adjustment you had to make to college hockey? Was it kind of the speed of the game, the physicality, or was it kind of just balancing school and hockey? Because uh, I know that's a challenge for some people just because the academics are a little more rigorous than prep school. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really have an issue with like the academics part. I think most, of the, most like the biggest thing for me personally, and I know a lot of people struggle with it as well, is like mentally actually. Like it wasn't necessarily that the game was faster, or that I wasn't as skilled. It was like mentally being able to be consistent for, for you know, all 60 minutes and be consistent throughout the season and not have these like wicked highs and lows. They just kind of need to be solid through the whole season. And mentally, that's really hard when you've got this pressure on you to make it into the lineup and perform for the team. So I think that was something I really battled my freshman year and affected me um, that kind of and that was like the biggest shift, I think, between my freshman and sophomore years. I kind of got my head screwed on straight and was like, all right, this is just hockey. Like, I, I know what I'm doing. Like, we're good. So yeah. it's definitely mentally was difficult. Yeah, it seemed like the adjustment like happened from your freshman and sophomore year if you look at the stats as well. So I guess kind of what did you do to make that transition from your freshman to sophomore year to 
kind of not worry about the, I guess, kind of handle the mental side of the game better than you did when you started off playing college hockey? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think, you know, like sports psychology and counseling was definitely a big part of it. Um, I sort of shifted my focus from doing like, you know, a lot of players have like a lot of uh, really strict rituals and routines. And I was like, I'm throwing out that I'm throwing it out the window. Like, I'm just not going to do whatever I want. I'm going to have fun. Just finding ways to like really focus on enjoying it instead of putting this pressure on like, oh, I need to perform like I need to do be perfect, all this stuff. And just being able to actually experience and really appreciate it for what it was, which obviously is easier said than done. But I was just kind of like, you know what, I'm here for fun. I'm only here for four years. Like we might as well just like have a good time with it. Exactly. So it wasn't easy, but <laughs> I think that's that's kind of what did it for me. Now talk about your freshman year because your team only won nine games that season, but I'm assuming you still had some fun doing it since you said that's what you were there in Vermont for. So just talk about that season, what you kind of took away from it and just um, that whole experience your freshman year and, and your first year in college hockey. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a hard it was a hard experience in that, you know, obviously our team wasn't super successful or as successful as we wanted to be. Um, I think it definitely made a difference that we didn't have. We had two seniors. So we didn't have a big upperclassman class. We had a big freshman class and we were all kind of looking at each other like, oh my God, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing here? So I, you know, having a young team um, definitely, definitely may, has an impact on, on how I think things are going to look on the ice. Um, I mean, it was, it was, it was a fun, it was a really fun year, obviously, aside from like the psychological part of it where, you know, struggling to kind of just adjust to the pressure and the consistent, like the need for consistency on the ice um, throughout the whole season. But I I'm convinced no one has a really like fantastic freshman year. If, if someone has like an amazing, awesome freshman year of college, like they're an anomaly, just because it is a really big adjustment in your life. Not to say there aren't like shining moments, but it's, it's always a hard time, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, I think the only freshman that I can think of that a great time is probably Jack Eichel with BU winning the Hobie Baker and making it to the national championship. Yeah. So that's yeah, probably the he's, one he's example you can think of. <laughs> one example, at least, at least from people I've talked to, my teammates and stuff, for the most part, it's always like, yeah, man, my freshman year was just tough. <laughs> yeah. Well, it must have been nice to have a lot of like freshmen on the team to kind of help you get through that. And especially since like, yeah. that's the core of your team, basically. So you guys were being put in situations that you haven't experienced before where most freshmen don't get to experience that. So that must have been nice yeah. for your development, at least to be, have that kind of um, ride with those people and be in those situations with those people, especially it must have helped your development um, as your years in college had headed on. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, the my class of like, was it five or six people? I mean, the, those are people that I still talk to on a regular basis now um, that just like really, it really bonds you. And it's really cool to have a class that like had, you know, got along with each other and, and really cared about each other. So I think that that definitely made it, uh, made it easier on all of us. Now, obviously we talked about the improvement you made individually from your freshman to your sophomore year, but your team also improved a lot from your freshman to your sophomore year. Your team went from nine wins to 15 wins. And so my question is what improvements did you make as a team to kind of, get over the hump and kind of have a more successful sophomore year on the ice? Yeah, I mean, again, I think a large part of it was our uh, our junior class really stepped up. Um, the freshman class that was fairly large got, you know, they, I think everyone just from the year before learned a lot and got better and we had a more experienced team. Um, we had some coaching staff changes as well. Um, I don't remember. We had, do we have a, no. I'm trying to, we had so many transfers in and outside. I'm trying to remember who came in and who left. But um, I mean, overall, I think having an older team um, definitely made a huge difference and our upperclassmen definitely stepped up, um, which really helped. And it was, it was a really cool year for us. I'm curious. One thing I heard from someone is like teams that are very successful in college hockey playoffs have good power play, good goaltending and have a lot of experience. Talk about the experience factor and just how important it is. Like, as an upperclassman as a, or as an underclassman, how does that experience help when you're in a playoff situation in like a high energy moment, I guess? Yeah, I think, you know, just I, when you have a lot of experience, it, it just helps you react a little bit differently. I think over the, you get, you, what's the best way to word this? 
in playoffs when, for example, if you're on the ice for a really long shift and you're like really tired and you get the puck, it's the experience that tells you you can make you can make a good play and you need to make a good play instead of just throwing it away and panicking. I think that it, it gives you a sort of different level of maturity that that, um, you know, a younger player might not have. Um, just based on, you know, playing lots of games and hearing, getting a ton of feedback, you know, three years worth of feedback versus none as a freshman. So um, it's like those little things, I think it's, it's, some, it's a little bit more subtle. Mm -hmm. And one thing I noticed doing research on your team was how you beat a lot of ranked opponents during time in college hockey. You, I feel like you guys were a team that upset a lot of people. And one highlight from your sophomore year was when you beat ranked Northeastern on, on the road. So yeah. my guess is we'll talk about what it was like being ranked opponents and what was your favorite upset that your team ever pulled off in your time in college hockey? Well, it's gotta be the Northeastern one for sure. I mean, that was, that was a huge one. Um, was I Kendall know my Coyne on that team? Pardon? Was Kendall Coyne on that team, if I'm not mistaken? Or was she, that like the year after she graduated? I think that was the year after she graduated. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, my one of my best friends on my team now, she was on that team. <laughs> <laughs> so we played against them. Um, but that was one of the biggest upsets. I, I mean, that was just such a cool experience. We were always the kind of a team that played better when we knew we were the underdogs versus when we were playing a team that was more evenly matched or that were supposed to be the underdogs against us. It was such a psychological thing. Um, so, I mean, that game and then my freshman year, there was like a big rivalry with us and BU and we beat, uh, we beat BU one of my first couple weeks of my freshman year. Um, so I had a huge team party afterwards. Um, so that was, uh, that was definitely, those are the two that I definitely remember the most for sure. Yeah, people forget those BU teams were absolute wagons. Like they had Victoria yeah. Bach, who I think was like yeah. one of the best players in college hockey a few years ago. So, and now she's like, I think she was on like the taxi squad for Team Canada's Olympic team. So mm -hmm. a lot of good mm -hmm. players on that team. So that must have been nice to, what was the party like after the upset? I, <laughs> I let's, We were just, also, it was one of those where the party start not started. The excitement started in the locker room and just kind of carried on. Where we were the whole night, we're just like we beat BU. Be <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it was just like it was a really satisfying feeling that just kind of fueled us um, the excitement for the rest of the night that we <laughs> that we had. So, what was the meetup spot after big wins? Like, where'd you guys go? Um, usually one of our upperclassmen's apartments where we would go and hang out with each other and play music before we decided on the next location. But, um, that later became my apartment. So <laughs> I thank all the upperclassmen before me, because I know the feeling when all of the, the entire team storms into your apartment and you're like, wow, I'm going to have to do some cleaning tomorrow morning. Yeah. We, we, hopefully the cleaning wasn't too bad. Hopefully your teammates weren't that messy. No, it was bad. No, it was bad. <laughs> Okay. Like, I wish I could say it wasn't bad, but it was bad. And it's okay. It's what I'm there for. The upperclassmen before did it for me. I do it for them. It's okay. <laughs> nice. Nice. It's kind of, you're kind of paying homage to them yeah, when you do that. Exactly. So exactly. Now, another thing that happened that sophomore year was you won your first ever hockey East playoff series. Now you get to be very lucky to say that because hockey East doesn't have playoff series anymore. They just do the single games. So I talk know. about what it was like winning a playoff series in hockey East and what it meant to your team. Yeah, I was so confused this year. I was like, what do you mean they're not playing? Like, they are not <laughs> playing more than three games. Like, what is this? Um, yeah, I mean, that was, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I was like, God, that's a bummer. But I mean, okay. Um, that was a really, really cool experience. I mean, just being, uh, being in the playoffs and um, just the excitement of playoff hockey. I mean, I think one of my favorite games that I just remember having so much fun in was playing, playing BC in the playoffs as the underdogs. I mean, it was such a close game and it was, it was just such a fun competitive um, environment. So, I mean, I mean, playoff hockey is just a whole different type of hockey. Like, mm -hmm. It reminds me of Danny Breer, who would be like, good in the season, the playoffs would start, and this guy would lose his, like, he would lose it, and he would just be this crazy, like, unrecognizable player, it's just That's like another level. Too. Yeah, exactly. I was like, he is the playoff king, and it just, you know, it's just that extra excitement that really, that really fuels you, and you get a lot of really cool competitive games out of it. And I believe you won that playoff series on the road. That must have been even more special, mm -hmm. that bus ride back. Uh, oh, yeah. Winning, winning on their ice. Absolutely. I was, we were still, I think it was Providence. 
yeah, it was, it was. It was such an awesome feeling. Yeah. Now talk about, you obviously have one of the coolest home rinks in college hockey that you got to play with, Gutterson Fieldhouse. I know they're renovating it, so I don't know if you've been back in a while, but talk about what it was like playing at the gut and just um, what's like playing in a wooden stadium because I've never been there before, but it looks very interesting from what I've been told and what I've seen. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of this like massive barn house in a sense. Um, I definitely fell in love with the rink. It's just got this kind of like charm to it. Um, kind of like this old school charm um, and when the when the rink was full it was really really fun like we have a huge student cheering section so when the rink was full it was just loud and just like full of energy um, and yeah I don't know it's just got this charm to it it also has the best sheet of ice that I've ever skated on the rink guys there were awesome they were so nice and they took such good care of us like there was just something about that ice where I was like this is the best sheet of ice I'll ever skate on that's it yeah. so um yeah <laughs> and it must have been nice to have that home ice advantage as well because all those teams have to travel up to Vermont and play you guys and most teams in hockey used to the home at home weekend series but you guys got to play two home games so there must have been yeah. some advantages to that as well yeah that was always so so nice so I mean I always look forward to the the two home games when we got to be on our ice because uh no one else's ice in the league could compare <laughs> Now, we were talking about the improvements you made over your time in college and kind of how you made that mental switch. And one thing that happened in your senior year was you were the captain of the team. So my question is, what type of leadership did you want to bring to the team? How honored were you to be named captain? And kind of how did you teach the younger players of that mental side of the game since you said you've noticed a lot of players go through that? And how did you try to teach those younger players like how to have fun as well? Yeah, I mean, I think my big part of me being captain was like advocating for our team and making sure that my team felt heard and that their wishes were being um, were being sort of articulated to the coaches and just work as like this sort of middleman um, and just making, you know, checking in with 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 teammates, making sure they're they're doing OK, they're not falling behind, you know, if someone, you know, if someone needs resources, you know, especially when it came to like mental health, I was really involved on campus with the student run organization there for mental health for student athletes. So, you know, trying to direct them to the right resources if they needed it. Um, you know, being, being someone that was always positive at the ring, trying to make sure, you know, people are making, making the best out of a day that might not be their best. Um, obviously it's, it's hard and I have hard days too, but it was obviously, it was, it was an honor to, to represent the team and felt, you know, feel like the girls could trust me and thought that I would do a good job sort of articulating um, our needs and wants. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a really cool, it was a really cool experience. Were you a vocal leader or lead by example? Um, I'd say a little bit of both. I definitely, I definitely was pretty vocal. Um, or tried to be, you know, there were times where I felt like I, you know, I could have, I could have said more, but I, you know, I, I think I tried to be a leader on the ice by example, just, you know, always working hard and trying to stay positive and not, not getting, you know, frustrated, trying to keep this team spirits up, even if we were down. So a little bit of both, I'd say. Now, looking back at your college hockey career, what'd you take away from that experience and how do you use it today in your pro hockey experience in Sweden? Um, Man, I mean, I would say a lot of it is is like the resilience and the consistency piece. It's it's one thing to be a good hockey player for one or two games. It's a whole other thing to be a good hockey player for an entire season and in playoffs. Um, just kind of building that like mental resilience as well. Um, being able to pull from places when you're really tired, like just being able to pull some extra energy out or or, um, you know, get your team riled up for when even if you're not feeling good or you're not having a good game, um, you know, I think that all brought valuable experience for, for when, you know, you're a professional player and that's your job is to show up to the rink and perform. So just remembering to kind of, kind of always at least enjoy it as much as you can and uh, just kind of look, look at things on the bright side. For yeah. Sure. Now I want to, I want to ask you one question um, about pro hockey before we get to the Olympics. Uh, just uh, what's it like playing pro hockey overseas and what kind of made you make that decision to go back to Europe and play pros there? Because I know it's a little bit different than the PHF, I believe it's called now, um, what you mm -hmm. played before after college. Yeah, I mean, the PHF worked well for me last year when I was working a full-time job and getting like ex 
clinical experience because I was doing this whole applying to med school thing. But this year, because it was the Olympic year, um, our coach wanted us to be close um, close by so I could fly easily between Sweden and Prague for camps and things like that. Um, and obviously the the hockey here is they've got a really great league being able to practice, you know, four or five days a week versus in the States where they only practice two, having a ton of games, um, having a lot of um, a lot of experience in the league. I mean, a lot, most of the league is your Swedish national team players, Finnish, Swiss, um, Austrian. So, I mean, it was, it was like kind of an easy choice for me and my club takes really good care of me. So I was like, even better, like awesome, awesome club. So I can't complain. Yeah. It was, it was an easy choice. You must love the bigger ice surface too, as a defender. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's a little bit more skating, but like the amount of room I have in the corners and the net, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. It's exactly what I want. <laughs> Now, what's Sweden like right now? I know COVID. I don't know what COVID's like there, I guess. So talk about Sweden. It seems like a, I've always wanted to visit some of those Scandinavian countries. They seem super fun and a place that not like many people would think of like as a vacation. Like one of my top vacation like bucket list items is Norway. I think that would be cool. Oh, yeah. Assuming Sweden's similar to what? Yeah, I mean, uh, COVID doesn't exist here. Uh, we just live our normal lives, if I'm being honest. The only time I was ever wearing a mask was before the Olympics. Uh, obviously, because sure. that was exactly when Omicron decided to rear its ugly head. I'm like, oh, great. Thank you. I just was like a stress mm -hmm. ball for like three weeks leading up to the Olympics. Um, COVID doesn't exist. Uh, just living our best lives over here, honestly. Um, it's, it's really cool. Everyone here speaks really good English, so I get by easily. Uh, it's a little cold, but there's lots of things to do outside. It's really a, a really nice outdoorsy place. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't complain aside from the winter, but yeah. I get I got over that in Vermont, so it's okay. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. And I'm curious about one thing about the Olympics. I know there's some college players that played on your team. How did they do the camps when they're so far away? Yeah, so they, they I don't know, they weren't, they weren't always at every single camp, um, but they got to the ones that they could. A lot of the teams would, like, were, were letting their players go just because they knew it was an Olympic year. Um, so it wasn't too, too much of a problem, but obviously I know how tough it is because I did it when I was in college to leave, have to talk to all your professors about your schoolwork. Then you've got a time difference as well, like a six hour time difference. So even if you want to log on to lecture, it's like midnight your time. Like, you know, it's just, it's, it's difficult. So it's feasible for them, but it's definitely hard. So let's start off talking about the Olympics. Your team qualified this past fall to make it to the Olympics for the first time in quite some time, just doing some research. So talk about what it was like qualifying for the Olympics and kind of what your reaction to it, like what emotions were you feeling? Yeah, I believe it was our first, it was the first appearance for women's Czech ice hockey in the entirety of history. So it was like no wow, pressure. That's cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it was crazy because I've been talking about, I've been talking about this with my team since I was like 14 years old. Um, my first Olympic qualifiers when I was 15 and then again when I was in college. I mean, it's just been such a long journey, like 10 years in the making that like it, when it actually happened, you just sort of like in shock, you just start crying and you don't know why you're crying, but you're crying. Um, yeah, I mean, highlight, one of the highlights of my entire life, honestly, so yeah. far. <laughs> I mean, when you've been working for something for so long and it actually happens for you, it's just indescribable. Yeah, I feel like people over here don't understand, like, how important it is and how, like, cool it is to for have your country qualify for the Olympics. Because I feel like here in the U.S., we just take it for granted that a women's team gets in every yeah. year or every four yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is it is difficult because for them, it's it's like, it, as you said, it's like a given that they're going to go, obviously, getting on the team is extremely difficult. But for us to, like, have been a team for, you know, we've got a group of people that have been to play together for, like, 10 years, been working towards the same thing for that long to finally, like, get there. Oh, yeah. it was just crazy. It was crazy. Now, has it fully sunk in the whole Olympic process uh, since you've gone back? And I guess, um, how, have you, how would you evaluate your Olympic experience both on and off the ice? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely kind of a whirlwind. Like, you don't, it doesn't really hit you until, like, people, I guess, like, not even now. I mean, just, just think, sit and think, like, oh, yeah, like, I was at the Olympic Village. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of crazy. Um, but, I mean, it, obviously, it, it, it's a hard tournament for us because, everyone's watching you know for a lot of people is the first time they've ever seen Czech women's hockey 
in their life, a ton of people at home. I mean, I had people DMing me telling me like, oh, like you guys played so well. I've never seen like our Czech women's team play. I didn't know you had a team. So, you know, we were making a really big impact, not only on our country, but on the whole like hockey world, I guess. Um, so it was, it was hard to manage the pressure and just being on that kind of stage. But again, it was, it was an, ex it was an awesome experience that I was able to share with like a lot of people I care about deeply. So, I mean, regardless of the outcome, I think it was just, you know, it was, it was obviously worth it. And it was, it was really, really, really mem memorable. And obviously getting the chance to play against some of the best players in the world, like that must've been really cool as well. Yeah, I mean, especially for us in the quarter fi quarterfinals, even at World, we never played Team USA. And to play Team USA on an Olympic stage was, I mean, that was just an awesome, awesome game to play. It was so much fun. Okay, yeah, they had 60 shots and we had six, but it was still an awesome game. <laughs> like, it was, yeah. it was, it was like one of the most fun games I've had, I've, I've, I've played as of recent, I would say. Mm -hmm. Your goalie stood on her head that entire oh, game. My that, was, that was incredible. Ridiculous. No, that girl is ridiculous. I was like, this game is going to sh showcase her. I mean, this is like, people are going to see how unreal she actually is. I think, you know, other games, she she does great, but like that game finally did her justice. I mean, she's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And kudos to your team. I thought you guys played Team USA very well, and I feel like a lot of your players kind of stood out to me watching your team play. So talk about kind of showcasing yourself as well, because part of the Olympics, I feel like, is that as, that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it was, we were, really wanted to showcase, like, our Czech style of hockey. Um, you know, again, like, like I said, a lot of people had never seen the Czech women's team play, so it was really cool to just showcase our team and the, what our talent and where we come from and the fact that we come from literally all over, like, our team is so spread out across the world, but the fact that we can come together as a team and play and, you know, be successful is, is really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And how do you handle that pressure of, because that's like, cause a lot, like you said, everyone, this is like the first time people are watching your team play for a lot of people in your country. This is the first time they're watching the Czech women's hockey team. So I guess, do you think about that at all when you're at the Olympics or do you kind of try to tune that out and how do you handle that pressure of trying to grow the sport in your country? Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's really hard. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I didn't think I was going to be really nervous. And then I started getting dressed and I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to throw up. Um, but you know, for me, I just, you try to just try and focus on having fun. Cause you know, you don't, you don't get to do that. A lot of people can't say that they've done that in their life. So I, you know, I was like, you know what, doesn't matter when I'm on the ice, how long doesn't matter. I'm just going to go out and have fun and do my thing and enjoy this moment. And putting on that Jersey for the first time, how much pride did you feel of getting the, cause that must be like a dream come true for yourself when that happened. Yeah, I mean, it was so cool, especially because they did such an awesome job on our jerseys. I was like, they oh, we got old school, <laughs> old school crest. We got the Olympic, Czech Olympic team patch. Like, it was so, so cool. It's just every time I got to put it on, I was just like, oh, savor this moment. Yeah, that's definitely, it was a definitely a really cool jersey. One of the yeah. best, actually, um, in the Olympics, in my opinion. Oh, I think so. I mean, I'm a little biased, but yeah, I have to agree. <laughs> I think Sweden's jerseys are really cool too. Like the yellow with like the yeah, green. the navy blue. I think that that looks sick as well. And obviously awesome. Canada's jerseys look sick too with the maple leaf. Like that, that as an American, I will admit that's a really awesome jersey. <laughs> but I would say as the U.S. had the best one because I have to be biased uh, towards my country. Just a little, just a yeah. little, yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and what were the atmosphere like at the games? Because watching it, it seemed kind of like only Olympians were allowed to watch the other, I guess, events. Were fans allowed at all? Or I'm just curious because it seemed like they were very strict about COVID in Beijing. Yeah, there were um, there were some people in the stands. I think some was open to the public. Um, I know that like our men's, uh, anyone on like the Czech Olympic team could come, like other athletes could come to our games and we would go to theirs, you would have to get like certain tickets for some games. Um, obviously, there was like a bit of the, the Olympic experience missing, you know, with with having fans and not being able to kind of leave the village, basically. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just one of those things you just got to kind of just be grateful for the fact that it could even happen and yeah. just kind of go with it. Yeah. What were some cool Olympic sports that you got to see besides hockey? Did you get to see the bobsleds? Because that's something I've always wanted to see. That looks fun. Unfortunately, the there was so there was like three different villages. So if you wanted to see like bobsledding or snowboarding, you'd have to take like a bus up to the other village. So we didn't oh. get a lot of 
time. I know a couple girls saw the snowboarders. Um, they saw the super G and then there was curling, which was actually really, really cool. Um, and I think figure skating, but other than that, we didn't get to, we didn't get to go out. I mean, I watched a bunch of hockey cause it was easy and we could go to the rink without tickets. So I watched a ton of, <laughs> ton of hockey, but other than that, not so much. Yeah. No, I feel like the, the bobsledding seems fun, but the curling seems interesting because it's just people like yelling at each other. And I don't want to be mean, but I feel like if you gave me four months, I feel like I could become an Olympic curler. It seems like a sport I can get pretty quickly. I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of technicalities that I didn't understand. We had uh, the, the Czech curling team was a husband and wife duo, which oh, I thought was an, awesome. <laughs> an even cooler dynamic. Like it was just really, really fun to watch them and just the way they interacted and the way they competed together. Um, definitely a little bit more nuanced than I, than I thought. Um, so, and once you kind of got the gist of it, I was like, oh, this is really exciting. Like I'm so yeah. into it, which I never thought I'd say, but they definitely changed my mind. Well, the snowboarding is probably my favorite event besides the hockey. Like there's this guy in the U S named Red Gerard. This guy's awesome. He's like the biggest skater bro ever. If you hear his interviews, he has like the long hair and he's like, yeah, man, we're just ripping nards and all that stuff. But he's so much fun to watch. Like that was my favorite, like Olympic event to see was watching him um, snowboard. I thought he was sick. Yeah. I wish, I wish I had I'd been able to see more of that, but I've heard that the snowboarders are a lot of fun. <laughs> I can, t I can, I feel like they would be just because if they like, they live life on the edge, but they have that laid back kind of tone to yeah. them, especially like yeah. Sean White, like all those guys seem super fun. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now, last question about the Olympics before we get to the non-hockey segment was, what was the opening and closing ceremony like and how much goosebumps did you have walking out of that tunnel? Because it looked pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, I didn't get to go to the closing ceremony because we had to leave within like a certain time period after our event finished. Oh, okay. um but the opening ceremony was crazy i mean you're just like in this gigantic stadium with all these lights and music and there's all these fans there i mean it was just i mean it, that is one of the coolest things i've ever been a part of i think hands down it was awesome <laughs> like i don't know how to i don't know how to describe it. it was just unreal now how cool is it to be called an olympian now like when people see they're like sammy cole or at Olympian that must be cool yeah. have you tried to yeah. embrace that at all yeah I mean I'll, I'll I, you know update my update my social media bios <laughs> it's just like weird maybe I'll feel it when I have it tattooed on my body somewhere but yeah that is that it's it's one of those things it doesn't really hit you quite yet yeah so we're now in a segment I like to call the non-hockey segment where I ask you some non-hockey questions to, to get to know you a little bit more off the ice my first question is I feel like you have the best style on the national team just by like looking at some of your Instagram posts and some of your teammates' Instagram posts. Very good style. The team has great style, but I feel like you, you might be number one. But besides yourself, oh. who has the best style on the national team? Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm going to pretend like I'm going to keep it a secret. <laughs> but like I think my one of the girls I used to play with as a D partner, Daniela Peshova, she's definitely got – I mean, she's – she's got a great sense of style off the ice and on the ice as well so she's basically a little model so i gotta give it to her <laughs> who's the funniest on the national team i can't say myself because that would be really you know that's not that's not you can't say that um <laughs> there's been people on the pod that have said themselves so you want to be you the know, i i can't say myself oh geez i don't even know it really depends because everyone's got their own special sense of humor. So it depends what kind of humor you're going for. If you're looking for dark humor, you go here. If you're looking for like potty humor, you go there. So <laughs> I can't give you a direct humor? answer. Who's potty humor, you know, talking about like farts. And, like, no, like, who, who's, and, like who's the best? Of, who has the best? Who's the best? Oh, God. <laughs> I, can't, I can't spill the secrets. They're going to uh, kill me if I tell you. <laughs> who has the best dry humor then? Because I like dry humor. Like someone that like says something, you're like, oh wait, that's really funny. Oh, it's uh, my one of my best friends, Katarzyna Bukowska. She is like so sarcastic and will come out with like the most savage comments where you look at her and you're like, oh my god, did you just say that? Amazing, amazing. <laughs> now doing research on yourself as well, you have eighty one thousand followers on TikTok. I thought that was pretty surprising. So my question is, what is your least favorite um, TikTok trend? Oh God. <sighs> I'm personally, this is so bad. I'm personally not a fan of like dancing videos. <laughs> like I am, you know what? I can't even say that because I do them too. Never mind. I take it back. 
My least favorite trends though. Oh gosh. I don't know. I like it. I like it when someone at least is showcasing like some talent or something funny. I feel like yeah. some people can get away with just staring at the camera, mouthing some words, and then that's it. And <laughs> I'm like, what was that? The stitches or whatever it's called. Or they're just or like, even just someone. like people, people like lip syncing, but they're not even like, <laughs> they're just trying to be attractive. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh yeah, we, that's part of the app cute. though. <laughs> it is. It is. I'm like, you are attractive. You are cute but you're not doing anything. Yeah. So that's why I couldn't like do, that's why I'm not a big, I'm, I'm a watcher for TikTok. I'm not really a mm -hmm. um, it's hard. video creator, whatever it's called. So yeah. I yeah. think my least favorite trend, and this was happened this fall was the Joe Byron trend. I don't know if you remember oh that. Oh my God. Yeah. But it just got so overdone and it just, I found it so annoying and everyone kept doing it like at school. Yeah. So I did not like that trend whatsoever. Just because, yeah. of, like, at some point, like, people overdid it. Overdone. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't. I that happens that. with most jokes online anyway, but that one just got so overdone, I could not stand it anymore. I, I was yeah. so no, upset I every time I saw it. <laughs> no, I feel you 100%. <laughs> now, what is your favorite color and why? I thought that favorite was an interesting color. question I threw in there. It shifts, but these days, it's actually, it's, I got to say, it must be green. Mm -hmm. shout out vermont so i gotta go with the green yeah yeah, yeah i like blue personally so I, I've, it's oh, it goes with most things i really like it a lot that would be my pick yeah blue jerseys look good green not so much <laughs> i think i think the vermont green looks good in my opinion so i'll give you yeah a... yeah forest green it can't be like a light green it's got to be like a dark green <laughs> yeah it's very hard to pull off green but if you do it can look really cool yeah for sure for sure now, obviously, you have participated in the Olympics, which is one of the best and well-known sporting events. So my question to you is, what is the best sporting event in the world? And it could be anything. Best sporting event? I have two answers, if you want me to give them. Oh, gosh. Let's, yeah, let's hear yours. So one is the Stanley Cup, big hockey guy, but it doesn't get better than Stanley Cup just because I feel like it's the best playoffs in all of pro sports. But if I had to pick another non-hockey event, I would probably choose the World Cup. I really like the World Cup just because it's so hard to qualify for that. And I feel like everyone's watching. Yeah, honestly, World Cup was like a big, big, has a big place in my heart. That was like when I went, especially when I was a kid, I grew up playing soccer and I was just like obsessed. I would watch that religiously. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm going to have to agree with you. Aside from the Olympics, because I feel like uh, like o Olympics, the gymnastics at the summer Olympics. I love watching that. That is one of the coolest things ever too. So that's like another one, but I'll, yeah. I'll give you the world cup for sure. And the Stanley cup. Has the Czech Republic ever qualified for a world cup before? Oh gosh. I feel like it's been a while. Yeah. But they, they, I feel like they, they used to be good when I was younger, but as of late, absolutely not. <laughs> well, they did something in the Euros. I remember that last year. Like they beat like a big team and moved on yeah. to the finals. So. They haven't been as good as they used to. When I was growing up, they were, it was like a big thing. Like Czech soccer was huge. And now it's definitely like hockey. Yeah. Well, the U S hasn't, didn't qualify last time. So it's not a big deal, but I remember when they beat Ghana in 2014, that was like really cool. It was like the one time I was like ever into soccer. So. That yeah. definitely shows you how the impactful the World Cup is around the world. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And then they played the Portugal the next game, and watching Cristiano Ronaldo play, that was super fun as well. So he's definitely yeah. one of my favorite yeah. athletes that doesn't play Absolutely. hockey. Absolutely, absolutely, for sure. He's unreal. Now, what is the most interesting thing you've read or, read or seen this week? Oh, read or seen? Jeez. Aside from, like, the day-to-day -day world news? <laughs> Because yeah. that is a right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing I've been, like, reading or Besides keeping up with. Besides the whole crisis, what has been the most interesting thing you've seen or read this week, I think? Oh, gosh. I mean, I, I listened to, like, a Medical Mysteries podcast, and they were talking about, like, some Alice in Wonderland syndrome. That was pretty interesting, but, like, that's really nerdy. Yeah. So, I guess that, that would be the in most interesting thing. Mm -hmm. So, I guess. Yeah. I can't think of anything interesting too. Probably the women's hockey bracket. I guess that was interesting. Seeing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. That was cool to watch and see how that panned out. So, so yeah. it should be a fun tournament, especially with some new teams in. So hopefully some upsets yeah. happen. I think that needs, I, will, I, will, I want some more upsets in women's college hockey. I don't think we get enough of them. No, for sure. I'm all about it. 
Now, if you could have lunch with anyone in the world, who would it be and why? Lunch with anyone in the world? Oh, God, the person I want to have lunch with is dead. So I... You could um, still say them. If they were dead, that if they weren't dead, it'd be Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> yeah. RBG, but other than that, I mean, that's the first person that comes to mind. Or Michelle Obama. I'm cool with her, too. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, um, for me, since you're from the Czech Republic, David Postnock would be awesome lunch. Just that's because also a good choice. Like a, he seems like a funny guy, so... I'll pick yeah. him just because it's you're you're in this episode. So yeah, that's true. That would be good. And I want to hear the story of how he chipped that tooth because I don't think he's ever fixed it in like two years. It's kind of funny. Uh, at that point, it's just like whatever. It's probably just gonna fall out completely anyway in a game. <laughs> yeah. So, but love me some pasta hockey. So yeah. hopefully they bring NHLers back to the Olympics. I in hope so. Four years, I think that'll be fun. I think it's gonna be Italy too. So for game times, like if you're in the U.S., to have it like at night, not at 2 a.m. is going to be great as well. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Now, last non-hockey question is, if there was a movie made about your life, who would you want to play yourself and why? Oh, God. Um, who would play me? I'm going to have to go with Jennifer Lawrence because I've gotten the, oh, my God, you look like her so many times. So I guess the physical I resemblance. And I feel like we'd have the same sense of humor. So mm -hmm. you know what? Like, I feel like that would be a great match. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Who would play Coach Palmer in the movie? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say, like, Danny DeVito or something. He would yeah. kill me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know any actors that would play I don't him. I, think be, I would love to see who would play him in a movie. So. I know. I, I'm trying to think. I don't know. That's a tough one. You gotta be bald. That's, <laughs> that's the only thing. Yeah. So. I think for, for myself, it would probably be, like, Andrew Garfield, just because I don't think we look alike, but I think he's a great actor. So I feel like he would portray my mannerisms well. So that's yeah. what I would think. Yeah, that's a good pick. It's a definitely a good pick. So back to some hockey questions now. My first question is, what advice would you give a younger player who's trying to pursue a Division One college hockey scholarship? Oh, gosh. Um, my advice would be to uh, – oh. Just because things are hard doesn't mean they're going to be hard forever. And usually, you know, the things that you want to achieve in life are hard. And if it wasn't hard, it wouldn't be meaningful. So you just got to sometimes push through it and and be determined and uh, don't let anything stop you or get in your way from what you really want to achieve. That's a great, great advice. <laughs> so. Great, <Eve. laughs> Next on hockey, our next hockey question is: What should be done to help grow women's hockey, but especially in other countries besides the U.S. and Canada? Because I feel like there was a lot of conversation about it. How U.S. and Canada seem to be the only countries for women's hockey that have, like, I guess, like, can, can, I guess, competitively, like, they're always making the finals. So, like, in your opinion, like, how should women's hockey grow in like Europe and other places so they can compete with the USA and Canada in like big tournaments like the Olympics? Yeah, I think generally, I think a big reason why it's it's easier to be successful is because I feel like sports and school are integrated so well, so you don't have to make that choice. I mean, I know at least in the Czech Republic, it's hard to um, integrate both of them because, you know, there's two separate entities. So, yeah, I I don't know. That's That's probably the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. And just in general, like, again, trying to get more, like, eyeballs to the TV, how does that work? Like, trying to get more, I guess, more viewers for, like, non-Olympic women's hockey events as well. That must be, like, a conversation I feel like people need to be having as well, where it's, like, you shouldn't be watching women's hockey every four years. Yeah, I mean, definitely the more exposure, the better. You know, the more exposure can go to women's hockey at the World Championships or um, just, like, even having professional leagues um would be would be the big that's like the big first step is you got to have the exposure i mean people can easily watch men's college hockey they have the nhl but we don't have that same you know exposure as men do mm -hmm. yeah no i totally agree i think like for women's college hockey i'm surprised like i feel like there should be better promotion for it because some of the basically every good player that you watch in the olympics played college hockey so like you're basically seeing like the best young players at, in the collegiate level and obviously it's very competitive as well if you watch the national tournament so i'm surprised that doesn't get promoted as much as it does so hopefully that continues to grow and more people start to watch that yeah that's a big thing 
Now, do you have any shout outs you want to give before the interview ends to any of your former teammates from UVM, any national team teammates or just family members or friends or someone that doesn't play hockey, but could be listening to this podcast. I don't know. Um, shout out to my parents for taking me to 5 a.m. practice. Otherwise I wouldn't be here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would say that'd be, that'd be it. <laughs> awesome. That's a great shout out. Well, thank you so much, Sammy, for coming on the podcast. I'll give you a shout out. It means a lot to myself. I really appreciate your time. It means a lot to myself. I wish you nothing but the best uh, for your pro hockey career in Sweden and the rest of your pro hockey career as well. And also your national team career as well. Hopefully a little more Olympics are in the future for you. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. Now, one question I want to ask you, and I pause.